à l'ENIAC, de la Université de Paris Sous et à Orsay. Et je vais dire quelques paroles sur sa trajectoire. Un conceituado mathématique qui a plus de 100 travaux publiés dans les revistes plus exigentes et compétitives. E ele foi aluno do professor Gulawick em 75 publicou sua tese e se eu tivesse que dizer dentro eh, da matemática onde a obra dele se situa eh, eu diria bom que em primeiro lugar é análise em segundo lugar é equações diferenciais parciais e dentro das equações diferenciais parciais é um dos elementos que mais aparece na obra dele é a propagação de diversos objetos. Essa propagação pode ser propagação de zeros, propagação de singularidades, propagação de analiticidade. E é, sua tese começou é, sobre estudo de certos problemas hipergólicos lineares, e onde se estudava propagação e, e na década de 70 essa foi mais ou menos é, uma época em que apareceram os operadores pseudo-diferenciais que foram uma, uma técnica muito importante que serve por um lado é, para provar estimativas e essas estimativas levam a problemas de existência e também os operadores pseudo-diferenciais servem para estudar singularidades de forma microlocal que eu não vou dizer o que é, mas é uma coisa mais fina do que local. Localmente seria numa vizinhança de um ponto e microlocal em uma direção. Só que nossa, não dá tempo para dizer o que, que seria isso. Mas é uma versão mais fina. Então, é, grande parte da é, década de 80 está dedicada à unicidade do problema de Cauchy. O problema de Cauchy é o seguinte, você tem uma equação diferencial num aberto, digamos, de Rn, e você tem uma hipersuperfície e tem uma solução de equação diferencial, igual a zero, pediu igual a zero, P igual a não linear em princípio, e, mas pode ser não linear. E você é, estuda sobre que condições o fato da solução se anular na hipersuperfície implica que se anula de um lado da superfície, ou do outro lado da superfície. Isso seria a propagação de zeros, porque se o zero que está na superfície avança. E é, eu estava dando uma olhada no Matsainet e eu descobri que eu fui o que fez o, o math review do trabalho dele no ANAS, em que ele é, prova o seguinte os resultados de Hormander sobre a unicidade de problema de Cauchy davam três condições implicavam que sobre três condições tinham é, unicidade no problema de Cauchy que eram se o símbolo principal fosse real se é, ele fosse principalmente normal que é uma condição técnica e bom, o que ele e uma terceira condição e o que ele fez foi que mostrar que se você tinha um operador que não se satisfazia essas condições, então você podia pegar uma perturbação de ordem inferior e provar que não havia unicidade. Então foi, de uma certa forma, em genérica, mostrar que essas condições essencialmente são não apenas suficientes, mas necessárias. E depois, é, então, durante a década de 80, ele trabalhou muito na unicidade do problema de Cauchy, e depois da década de 90, ele passou a se interessar por problemas dentro de um contexto hiperbólico, mas por problemas não lineares, em que na equação da onda, que é o protótipo do operador hiperbólico linear, você tem solução para todo o tempo. Mas quando uma não linearidade é introduzida, pode ser que no tempo finito a solução deixe de existir, por interação da solução com ela mesma que se chama tempo de explosão, o tempo de vida, quanto tempo vai durar. E o assunto que ele vai falar agora está relacionado com isso, ou seja, um operador 
é, quase linear, ou seja, não é linear, é perto de linear, mas é hiperbólico. O predador hiperbólico, quando fosse linear, a solução teria, teria sempre mais estudar quando, é, você pode dizer que a solução existe para todo o tempo, quando explode, quanto demora a explodir, e esse vai ser o assunto é, essencialmente da conferência dele. So, okay, now I will switch to English, and so Professor Sanjarinyak will talk on blow up of quasi-linear web equations, survey, and open questions. Thank you. So, so first I would like to, to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me, and I'm very happy to be here in this great country that the second time. <laughs> So I will speak about uh, blow-up for a quasi-linear equation. So what does it mean, blow-up? It means two things. Blow-up, it means so finite time. And it means at infinity. Okay, so finite time is what you think. You have a nonlinear equation. You start from smooth data and you expect, in general, the solution to blow up in finite time. That is not remain smooth. Okay, so this is uh, something which exists already for ordinary differential equation. And, okay, so blow up at infinity would mean that you have a global smooth solution of some nonlinear equation, but you feel that at infinity, the behavior is not what it should be, in a sense that has to be made precise, OK? So you think it's still global in time, but something happens at infinity, OK? So of course, this is related to, to many subjects like, for instance, uh, general relativity. where you are interested in perturbing some known Lorentzian matrix, solving Einstein equation, vacuum Einstein equation, and you want to have a global metric on your manifold, say R4, and you are interested in to understanding what happens at infinity, because what happens at infinity corresponds to physical things. You see, the geodesic completeness and all the things corresponds to decay and behavior at infinity. Okay, so, so the interesting point is that these are connected. Okay, these two things are connected because some people think that studying this is, is, is not interesting because they will tell you in all physical problem everything is global. <laughs> okay, but in fact they are connected. So in this talk I will try to to sketch briefly some results about finite type blow up. And then I will talk about global solution with some behavior at infinity. And then I will give an example of this connection. It's a very well known example. Okay. And then uh, I will restrict to quasi linear wave equation. Okay because it's simpler, because of course you could say a lot of things on other things, but this is the most studied case. So this is what it is. All right. Uh, so this is a quasi-linear wave equation, so box is just dt squared minus Laplace in x, the, the usual box, and then you have some nonlinear terms Okay, that's second order terms with coefficient depending on the first order derivative. All right, so alpha, beta, and uh, this guy, they run from zero to three. <coughs> okay, this is a quasi-linear wave equation. So I will insist on open questions because you see, I want to advertise the field a little bit. And I think this is a field where there are many open questions. I would not say everything is open, but because I worked in this field, so it would mean that I did nothing. <laughs> it's not completely open, but it's almost open. Okay, so I will insist 
just quote some theorems and insist on open question. All right, so this is a quasi-linear wave equation. And you are interested in the fact that the coefficient depend on the gradient. So you introduce capital U. The capital U stands for all the derivative uh, of U. <coughs> Essentially, I take n equal 3 everywhere. Okay, It doesn't really matter. <coughs> and you introduce this function G. So G is just, in fact, <coughs> that's a, <coughs> a polynomial. G alpha beta, that's a sum. And the G alpha beta gamma, for simplicity, are taken to be just constant, real constant. All right, so this is the thing I will focus on. OK, so what is finite time blow up? So what is quasi-linear? Well, quasi-linear means that <coughs> the, you see the coefficient of the second order term depend on the first order derivative. You see, it's because fully nonlinear would be something like f of u uh, x, u, u, u. This would be fully nonlinear. Okay, quasi-linear, that it's linear in the higher derivative. Okay, it's simpler, but essentially, if you take this and you take it, but you see, all examples are like this, essentially. All right, so what is finite time blow up? It is this situation. You, you get some time, you get some point. Okay, you get some, say, V. All right, so I will say that U has to be C1 in V bar. And uh, U is, say, infinity in V for T strictly T. OK, so U is, say, infinity here strictly before t, it is c1 up to here. And then you have uh, u double prime goes to infinity when uh, x goes to n. <coughs> OK, so why this and why this? Because you see, <coughs> you want the principal part of the, your operator, you want the first order derivative of u to be continuous here. Okay, so that you, you do have a geometry of your operator with you have characteristics. Okay, so this allows a known say a reasonable a geometry of by characteristics. <coughs> OK? And uh, now why u double prime should blow up to infinity? Just because uh, it is well known that if u double prime does not go to infinity, if this stays bounded here, then the solution actually is to infinity everywhere. OK? There is no blow up. Okay. So the blow up can occur only on this. Okay. So you see an operator like this. What is going to blow up? It is the derivative of the coefficient. The coefficient is grade u. So the derivative of the coefficient has to blow up. Okay. So let me remind you that if, if say, exists m such that this is smaller than m for t, OK, if you had this, so this would imply that, in fact, u is, say, infinity in v bar. OK, so nothing happens. You have a smooth solution. All right, so this is what you expect. So the first, the first theorem is this, minimal rate. <coughs> so what does it mean, minimal rate? It means that you, you are interested in the way this goes to infinity, OK, in terms of capital T minus T, in terms of this distance here. And uh, you cannot be less than 1 over capital T, OK? So here, I took T equals 0. OK, so you see, this tells you that if 
u double prime is less than some smaller constant over t, then in fact there is no blob. Okay. In fact, there is, so this is much stronger than that. Okay. So you allow u double prime to behave like a constant over t, but if this constant is too small with respect to the value here, then there is no blob. Okay. So this is, so you see, 1 over t is the minimal rate of blow up. You cannot do less. If you do less, then in fact you don't blow up. You are, say, infinity all the way. OK, so this is, uh, this is an easy theorem. <coughs> OK, so that's one, one point. So next point, then you want to know, uh, you want to know uh, how, how can you construct examples of this thing? Okay, you have your quasi-linear wave equation. And you want to see such solutions, okay? Like this. Okay. Because of course, if your equation happens to be linear, then you will never see that. Okay. Everything will be smooth. You don't have blow up. So what does it mean, nonlinear? Okay, how nonlinear? Okay, so this is the next next thing. So you have two you have two concepts. Okay, the first one is uh, genuinely nonlinear k. This is the k the concept by Lax, okay, which is uh, <coughs> It means that you have some characteristic point, p equals 0. p is the principal symbol of your operator. So let me just remind you. Okay, p of u and c is just c0 squared minus uh, this plus g alpha, beta, gamma. <coughs> u gamma c alpha c beta. This is a principal symbol of your operator depending on these guys here. Okay, so you if you have a characteristic point for which this function g, which is there are sums everywhere, of course. Huh? for which g is not 0, so this is a genuinely nonlinear case, then you can actually construct a piece of solution like this. Okay? And more precisely, you can uh, you have this, uh, I'm sorry. More precisely, you have this behavior, okay, that u double prime, you see the singular part of u double prime is 1 over d, so d is just like this distance here. So this is d. It's like 1 over d, a rank 1 matrix. Okay, So this is a little strange, but uh, you see? So we call it a rank 1 blow up. <coughs> uh, So let me keep here. So u has to be c1 everywhere, and u double prime is supposed to go to infinity. So that's the case I'm interested. OK, so typically, you see, whenever you get one point, which is genuinely nonlinear, then you can construct uh, a solution like this. <coughs> uh, well, in some cases, you can do more, but I will not insist on that. OK, so that's one case. So of course, the question is, can you construct solutions which blow up quicker? OK, here you have 1 over t. Can you get a, a higher rate of blow up? Yes, you can if you have a degeneracy. OK, that is. You see, the idea is. You see, so the the weaker 
the nonlinearity the stronger the blow up okay this is also true for ODE okay if you take for instance y prime equal y to the k okay if you have a big k you will have a a slow blow up. If you have a small k, you will have a bigger blow up. Okay, because if if the equation is weak, so the, the solution takes advantage of this weakness to, to get a singularity into it. Okay? So in this case, you see linearly degenerate, what does it mean? You have a characteristic point, but this time g is zero. Okay, g is zero. In the preceding case, g was not zero. And if it's not identically zero, like some derivative of g is not zero, then you can play the same game, except that now d, you see, so let me point it out here. You see, now d, <laughs> you have a curve like this, and here d behaves like uh, t square. All right, so you have a t square blow up. Okay, you see, so. Excuse me? When the t appears as an exponent. No, 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 this is transpose. <laughs> no, you are right. No, no, this is just, you see, this is a rank one matrix, a column times a line. All right, so what are the open questions? on this, for this section. Well, the first open question is about stability. Okay, that is, suppose you have your, okay, suppose this is, okay, so suppose this is a domain of determinacy. All right, so u is, say, infinity everywhere here, okay, and then u stops being, say, infinity at this point. All right, so stability means, suppose now you move a little bit the Cauchy data here, are you going to have a blow up somewhere else close to m, or will it disappear? Okay, this is stability. All right, so the first question is, which blob singularities are stable? All right, so my conjecture is, is that if you are a minimal rate singularity, then it's stable. You see, so analogously, it's just like a simple zero. If you have a function with a simple zero, okay, so if you perturb the function, you will never get rid of this simple zero. Okay, you get another one close to it by implicit function theorem, all right? So in singularity, it's, it's something similar. If you have a minimal rate singularity, that is, u double prime behaves like 1 over t minus t, then I conjecture that if you move a little bit this, then you will get blow up at a close, closer by going. Same phenomenon, slightly moved, OK? So this conjecture I proved for a special type of, of blow-up that I uh, have no time to discuss here, what I call a geometric singularity of cusp type. Okay, this is a kind of generic blow-up. And for this generic blow-up, I do prove that if you change, you have the same thing happening at a nearby point. Okay, in general, I don't know. Okay, so now, uh, what is interesting is that in the in the linearly degenerate case, you can arrange the blow up to be unstable. Okay, that is, you can arrange this. We have seen that in this linearly degenerate, you have 
a higher rate blow up. You have a square here, and you can arrange this. You can have your blow up, all right, with use infinity below. And so for some perturbation, then you will have, at another point, then you have a point, a blow up like this. Okay, so as you see, the, the higher blow up, if you perturb it for some perturbation, you will go back to the stable one, to the minimal rate one. And now for other, for other perturbation, for some other perturbation, then you don't have blow up anymore. Okay, so it's smooth. Okay, so it means so that is you have a fixed region such that for some perturbation you will be smooth in this region. Okay, so the blow up disappears. Okay, so you see it's just like if suppose you have a, a no not simple zero of a function. Okay, so if you if you move the function downwards, so this double zero will transform to two. Thing. If you move it up, it disappears. Okay, so this analogous, you see. So this, you see, this conjecture, this is to support the conjecture that uh, for, s for this higher rate, you don't have stability because depending on the perturbation that you make, you can make the blow up disappear or not. All right, so this was the first open question. Okay, so this is, uh, I really don't know. Okay, so n the next question is, assume that all characteristic points are simple and genuinely nonlinear, which is that, you see? So, which means that whenever P is zero, uh, then, this implies that uh, the, the C0 roots are simple and, and G is, is not zero. Of course, except zero. All right? <coughs> so in this case, uh, I believe that I believe that the all blow up singularities are like this. Okay, so so that's not clear, but I believe it's true. So this is again an open question. All right, and uh, and the last question is now suppose g is identically zero. So what happens? Okay, because in the preceding theorem, for the linearly degenerate case, g was zero at one point, but not identical. So. What is an example of G identical is zero? It's very simple. Okay, so this is an example where G is identical is zero. Okay, because you see, if you compute G, If you compute G, you get C1, C2 square minus C2, C1, C2. So G is identical, is zero. Okay. So in this case, for instance, you see, uh, I don't know what happened. So it means that the the nonlinearity is very weak. So you expect a strong blow up. You see that the paradox, because if if you have a linear equation, the nonlinearity is very very weak, so to speak. And you have no blow up. But if you have a nonlinear equation with a weak nonlinearity, you expect a higher red blow up. All right. So this is again an open question. And the last question, where well, there is a mistake here, I'm sorry. You should read in, in OQ4, you should read C0. Okay, because you want u in the coefficient to be continuous, and of course, u prime will blow up in this case. 
Okay, so what is the interest of this special case? Well, because this is a baby model for, for Einstein equation. Okay, so let me write, let me remind you what uh, Einstein equation in harmonic coordinates is. Well, this is give the motivation for that. Okay, so Einstein equation. Vacuum. In harmonic coordinates, whatever it is, it is something like this. So you have a box G of G alpha beta equals F alpha beta of G great G. Okay, so and box G is just G lambda mu beta mu. It's a sum, okay? And, and this is the inverse matrix to this one. Okay, so this is a diagonal system. You have the same operator for all components, all alpha and beta, and this is quadratic in, in G. Okay, so you see it's just a system of things similar to this one here, because you see the coefficient, the coefficient, they depend on G. So this is a function of G because it is the inverse matrix of this one. Okay, so this is just a baby model. So I tried to construct uh, blow-up examples just like this. Okay, you should be C0 here because of the change. And your prime should blow up. I did not succeed, so if, if anybody has an idea, he's welcome. Okay, so this is finite time blow up. All right, so maybe I should uh, uh, point out some well-known applications about a global theory of the Cauchy problem, application of the preceding concepts, okay? So now you consider, again, a wave equation, just always the same wave equation. Okay, and then you, you consider small data, which means what is written here, it's epsilon u0, epsilon u1. Okay, u0 and u1 are smooth functions, say, say infinity. the infinity zero given function, and then you take epsilon to be small enough. Okay, so this is a problem which has been studied very long after John and Kladerman and Hermander. And, uh, and the results are essentially that the, for small epsilon, the solution lives for a long time, which is T epsilon. T epsilon is the lie lifetime of the smooth solution. Okay, and this T epsilon can be approximately computed. It depends on the dimension, okay? So you see for dimension two, it's just like uh, one over epsilon square. For dimension three, it's like uh, e to the c over epsilon. Okay, and in fact, these limits uh, have been conjectured by Hermander, and I proved that essentially uh, what is written here holds for a uh, reasonable, there is some, some generic assumption on the data, okay, which is very reasonable. And with this assumption, then you have existence of this limit, that is, gives you a lower bound for existence and an upper bound. All right, and in fact, what happens is that in these cases, you can prove that, you see, this is a picture. So you have the data, all right? So your solution is zero here, the data are zero here. This is t equals zero, all right? And then for some large time t epsilon, then you have a blow up at, at one point, 
So you have here exactly the picture that I had before. Okay? That is, u double prime is blowing up with a rank one singularity, and in fact, a, a singularity of curves type that I did not uh, explain. All right? So you see this, what I want to say, that the, the example that I showed before actually occur in real cases. All right? I'm not saying that this is the only thing which can occur. Of course, I'm far from being able to say something like that. But in this particular problem with small data, I know that if epsilon is small enough, there is a T epsilon which has this asymptotic value. And there is one point such that, that here you have exactly the situation that I described before for in the genuinely nonlinear linear case. Okay? So here you have the situation described before. For the genuinely nonlinear case. All right, so this is this is it. All right, now you see now you see the first connection with uh, blow up at infinity is that if g, always the same g that we're playing a role here, is g is identical is zero, okay, then for small data you have global existence. Okay, so g, you see, uh, controls the blow up. Okay, the nonlinear, genuinely nonlinear was that at some point g is not zero. If g is identically zero, and epsilon is small, then you have a global thing. That's a well-known null condition of Christodoulou and Klanama. OK, so now I'm going to, to switch to global solution and behavior at infinity. And then, eventually, I will connect both. OK, so this was the first part about finite time blow up and applications. All right, so let me talk about blow up at infinity now. So there is a first, a first approach. So I'm still keeping the same equation, OK? Always the same equation. But now I have a different point of view. I'm looking at global solution. I'm trying to say something about them. OK, so first thing, in this case, same equation, small data. Then you have an asymptotic analysis, which is due to Hermander and which tells you that u has to behave like this, that epsilon, where everything is of size epsilon, so epsilon over r, r is the decay rate at infinity in dimension 3, and some function of r minus t. Okay, so r minus t, it is this distance, essentially up to m. Okay, so that the distance to the light cone, omega, which is, okay, At the usual polar coordinates, OK? No problem. And tau. So tau is the slow time, which is here. OK? So this is epsilon log t. OK? So why is this epsilon log t? Well, you have to compute what happens to your solution if epsilon is small and the time is large. And you find that you have an expansion involving this slow time tau. OK, so tau is called the slow time. OK, if you had, if you had no tau, so you would behave like a free solution of the wave equation, essentially. All right? So you see, this slow time is just giving you the effect for large time of the nonlinear terms. OK. So now if you want, you see, if you take u in this form and you plug it into the equation here, and you compute the main terms, so you get this. OK, so the function f should satisfy some equation. Okay, and the function g, which appears here, 
is always the same, g of omega, always the same g as before. OK? So, so you see, in the case where g is identically 0, you find that, in fact, f should not depend on tau. OK? But if g is not identically 0, <coughs> then you expect blow up in finite time, you see? This is reflected in the fact that for this equation above here, that's just an ODE for d sigma f, OK? This is an ODE for d sigma f. So sigma is r minus t, OK? An ODE in tau, OK? So if g is not identically 0, this ODE is going to blow up in finite tau, which means this like this. Okay, this is equivalent to the tau equal uh, c. <laughs> All right. So this kind of asymptotic thing uh, can be generalized. It has been extended by Lindblad and Wanyansky, and they introduced the concept of weak null condition. So what is it? So the idea is this. Uh, let me. Okay, if you extend it to not just for this equation, but you can do this for a system, and in fact, they can do it for Einstein <coughs> equation. Okay, so what happens is that <coughs> uh, you have the uh, original system. On one hand, and here you have the system on d sigma f, on the other hand, OK? So the, the original system is just like this, but a more general thing with the system. And the reduced system is a system that you obtain by this asymptotic analysis, OK? That's, that's an OD system, OD in slow time tau. OK, so I will not insist very much. So suppose, for instance, you have a system like this with two unknown, u1 and u2. Box u1 equals some quadratic terms. Box u2 equals some other quadratic terms. When you perform this asymptotic analysis, you get this. Well, I don't insist on the detail. And, uh, and then it's easy to see that for this system, so this is an OD system on f1 and f2. Uh, more precisely on d sigma f1, d sigma f2. And you can easily check that this OD system has global solution in tau, and they are at most exponentially growing. Okay. So, so this gives what you see, so the idea now is that this system here, you see, is just like a skeleton of the other one. Okay? So that's supposed to carry the essential feature, right? So the question is, if you know something here, can you say something here? OK, so that's the two open question. All right, so you see you have the question in both directions. So if, if this system has global solutions, at most exponentially growing, which is a little technical thing. Does it mean that this one has global solution? It's not clear. Of course, it's a hint. Okay, you don't have an immediate abstraction. And on the other hand, suppose this system blows up in finite time. Does it mean that this blows up in finite time? So it's open in both directions. Of course, there are examples. Okay, <laughs> there are examples where I gave some papers where I proved that for many cases where this system has global thing, then this one has global thing. Okay? That's a help to understand. But it's not clear in general. Okay? And the other one also. Okay? So these are, I think there are plenty of cases to study, and there are some algebraic difficulties. But you see, it's still completely open. Okay, so this one. Uh, the question about blow up. All right, so now um, let's see. Okay, 
So we have seen one, one case of global. So we'll talk about blow up at infinity now. I will talk about blow up at infinity. So this plus null condition, which means that whenever you have this, this implies g equals 0. You see, null condition doesn't mean that g is identically 0. It means that it is 0 whenever you have this. So I don't have time to explain where it comes from. OK, so now I will assume that you have this. So for small data, you have global solution. Now I'm going to try to understand what do they do, this global solution at infinity? Do they blow up? Don't they blow up? What does it mean? What is the connection with finite time blow up? All right, so let me, let me discuss this connection. OK, so the connection is well known. In this case, it is essentially due to Christodoulou. It is using conformal inversion. OK, so let me remind you what conformal inversion is. So this is 0, this is t, this is x, so this is c, which is <coughs> this open light cone, and it is given by this formula, x over t squared minus r, r squared, and t equal minus t. So it sends the upper part into the lower part, and in fact, uh, i squared is identity. OK? All right, so what is the point of this thing? Is that it will compactify infinity into finite thing. Okay, so the discussion of blow up at infinity here will amount to a discussion of blow up at finite points, right? For which I can use the concepts I introduced before and the example and this and that. Okay, so this is easy. So let me give you some formulas. Let me give you some formulas. Okay, so this is, you see if you have a, a free wave equation box u equal f, then when you transform it by this conformal inversion i, you get essentially another wave equation if you introduce u of i divided by t squared over r squared. All right? So now the way you transform the Cauchy problem is this. Okay, you take t, here you take t naught. So, Be a bit more precise. So, Cauchy data vanish for x. Okay, you take this, and now you consider the Cauchy problem with data here. Okay, because you want everything to play inside C. Okay? So you put the data here, instead of putting them at t equals 0, you put them here. So you see, so, so this is m, and the solution will be 0 here, and the solution will live here. So it will live completely inside c, and you can apply i. All right. So what happens is that if you do this, then you get here t0, which is minus 1 over t0. and uh, you get compact Cauchy data. <coughs> OK, so let's take notation. So let's introduce W. So W is the key thing. So U of i, the transform solution, you set it like t squared minus r squared W. So this is the big variables, x and t. r is just. OK, so now you see u is living here, and w is living here. All right? So now infinity for u here, which is called null infinity, 
corresponds to going to some point here for w. Okay, because these points, you see, for these points, t, t squared equal r squared, so they correspond through i, they correspond to a point at infinity. Okay? So now the key computation, so this is for the wave equation. Now, for the full thing, the key computation is that you get for w, you see that's a little technical, that is you don't use the transform of u, you use the transform of u divided by this because of the first formula above, right? And you get this for w, you get box w plus a certain, okay, so these are uh, nonlinear term. All right, so, you see, the miracle is that because you have the null condition, which is an algebraic condition on G, if you transform everything, then you get for W a solution of some similar perturbation of the wave equation with compactly supported Cauchy data. So this is zero here. Okay. Well, this is technical. I don't have time to explain, but this is very easy to check. Okay, so the question is now, uh, the question is about the behavior of, the, of your solution. Okay, so the behavior of solution is this. Yeah, Q bar, yeah, exactly. Q bar is something of the same type with depending on X and T also, okay? Essentially, it's some nonlinear quadratic term, right? But smooth, no singularity, that's the point. Because if you, if you don't have this and you transform, you get singularity like 1 over T squared minus R squared in your operator, okay? But this null condition gives you here a nice thing. So what happens? But if you consider small solutions, okay, so if u is small, so w is small. If w is small, this is a nonlinear problem with small data, so it's going to exist, w is going to exist, say, for some large time. And so in particular, w will be, okay, so small solutions will exist. Uh, in C infinity of T bar. So let me call it like this. So T is this triangle here. Okay? Just because you ignore these lines, you have C infinity zero data, you have this, you take a small, small data, so you have a smooth solution for a large time. Okay? So in particular, it will be smooth in the closure of this triangle here. So, so to this W corresponds a U which is global and which behaves like a free solution, okay? So a uh, small solution W will exist smoothly and this implies that U is global and U behaves like a free solution, that is a function of R minus T, omega and one of R. <coughs> Exactly like a free solution. Okay, so in this case, you say that there is no blow up. Now, on the other hand, suppose this Cauchy problem has a finite time blow up somewhere here. Then this finite time blows up, translates into a finite time blow up here. Okay, so that's it. You have a finite time blow up. So what is the case in between? So the case in between Okay, so blow up at infinity would mean what in this case? Okay, so blow up at infinity for you 
would correspond to W belongs to exist, say, infinity in T, open. OK? Because this, this open region here maps into the whole thing. So you get a global U, but W will not be smooth up to the boundary, which means infinity. OK? So we'll up at infinity for U. With W will be here, but there exists M belonging to the boundary such that W is singular at M. All right? So this is blow up at infinity here would mean that you get a W for this equation with this data, and this W is smooth inside and has a singularity here. All right. So the first open question is that this exists. Okay, so I strongly believe that such a W exists, but I cannot prove it. Okay. I cannot prove it. Uh, so it's I will say in the end a word about this. Okay. And now, suppose you can construct solutions W of this with a singularity here, okay, some kind of singularity, then this will reflect into constructing a U which is global, satisfying this equation with the appropriate data, and which will blow up at infinity in a way which is translated from this one here. Okay, so this is the connection between the two. So uh, one thing, so now you see the issue is you are going to look at this equation and try to see whether you have genuinely nonlinear points or linearly degenerate points and so on. Okay? So it turns out that all these points here, which corresponds to null infinity, they are all linearly degenerate points for this equation. This is the theorem here. Okay, so I was very happy to, to prove this because, you see, this, the truth is that this thing is a mess. Okay. <laughs> so it doesn't look like it has any special property, but if you look carefully and mess around with some algebra, then you find that all these points at the boundary are linearly degenerate points in the sense I explained in the first part. Okay. So the question is, what does it mean? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You see, it should mean something for this equation. Okay. Something which tells you that for the global solution of this equation, if they blow up at infinity, then they should blow up in such and such a way. Okay. But I was not able to, to carry this over clearly. So let me finish by discussing a little bit stability issue. Okay. So what is the problem about stability? What does it mean, stability? It means, suppose you have a global smooth solution here. OK? So if you perturb a little bit the data, do you still have a global solution? And what is the behavior of the next one? Okay. So I will not discuss complicated perturbation. I assume that you just take the data and add, say, a epsilon some C0 infinity function. OK, so the question is, for small epsilon, do you still have a global solution? And what is the behavior? So if you translate this here, OK, so you have a global solution u. So it means that you have a global solution w in this open triangle here. All right. And now, so this is a kind of miracle that you have a global solution in the, this triangle for this, OK, because it's just that's given. And now, suppose you perturb a little bit the data here. So what will happen? Will it happen that W will develop a singularity inside, or outside, or nowhere? Okay. So this is stability. Because if you perturb and W gets a singularity here, it just means that perturbing the data will give you a finite time blow up. 
right? So there is one result which is easy, which is easy is that if if w is uh, I'm looking for my if w is smooth, then u is stable. Okay. So this is one obvious direction. W is say infinity. In the closed thing, implies table. Okay, because if you have W smooth up to the boundary, if you perturb the data, you will get another W smooth up to the boundary for a small perturbation. All right, so this is it. Now, on the other hand, uh, this is not clear. Okay, because suppose U is smooth inside and, and has some singularity here. So what you believe, what I believe, is that in this case, if you perturb a little bit, this singularity will enter the triangle, and so we will get finite time blow up. All right, so it looks like, you see, blow up at infinity is some intermediate case between free behavior and finite time blow up. All right? So, so this is a question. So here you have some, I wrote some theorem about stability of U, which is not in terms of W. It is uh, some internal thing. But I don't have really time to explain the notation. So, so let me finish with two open questions. Okay, so you see the first thing is that this looks like it's true. Looks true. Looks true because, <coughs> because if you if W had a singularity on the boundary, it doesn't seem that he would resist all perturbation of the data. But that I don't know how to prove it. Okay, so it looks true. This is open question ten. Okay, and then the open question 11 is that suppose you do the natural thing, okay? So you start from, say, epsilon u0, epsilon u1, okay? You start again with small data, all right? So if epsilon is small, then w is smooth everywhere. Now you increase epsilon, okay? So you increase epsilon, so for some epsilon, the singularity of w will... Okay, suppose it's here for a small epsilon. So when you increase epsilon, W will blow up quicker and quicker, so you expect the singularity to move. And at some, for some limiting epsilon, you will reach the boundary. Okay, and for this critical thing, then you expect the corresponding U to blow up at infinity. Okay, and this is still an open question, so I don't have time to discuss examples, but it's, it's not so, so obvious that it looks, okay? So the question is, for this limiting epsilon, do you get a solution which blows up at infinity, or do you get already a finite time blow up? I think it depends. It depends on some algebraic condition on the nonlinearity. Okay, so I will finish here. So I, what I wanted to say is, I just wanted, maybe you could not follow all the details. It does not really matter. I want to say that there are a lot of open questions. Okay? A lot of examples to be constructed, to be looked at. And I think there are enough young, bright people in this country. So I hope some will go into this field. Thank you very much. Thank you.